Hello and welcome to this PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Ben Hobbs and I will be your host today. If you're joining us live, remember that you can ask questions at any point by clicking the Q&A, which is located near the bottom center of your screen and typing your questions into the pop-up window. If you see a question in there you would also like the answer to, you can prioritize that question by clicking the thumbs up icon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guests today, Tim Thurman and Madeline Stange, PhD student and postdoctoral fellow in the biology department at McGill University. Thanks for joining us today. I'll let you take it from here. Hi, Ben. Hi, everyone. Um, do I, well, do you wanna introduce yourself? Or I yeah, so uh, I'm Madeline. So as Ben already mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the Red Cross Museum. Uh, in Montreal, and we are very excited to tell you a little bit about adaptation and evolution today. Can you see our screen? Yep, that looks perfect. perfect. Okay, and yeah, my name is Tim Thurman. I'm a PhD student here at McGill University. And yeah, so we wanted to tell you a little bit about our research um, and to sort of kind of introduce you to the, to the concept of what we study. I want you to think of your favorite animal. So mine, mine is the penguin. Um, and probably one of the things that you find interesting about your favorite animal, it's, it's probably something that's what we would call an adaptation. So this is a feature of the, of the organism that allows it to live better in its environment. So when we think of penguins, we have the black and the white color to help them hide from predators um, that are you know, looking, down, uh, you know, looking down in the water so they're kind of hidden against the dark ocean or they have all these feathers to help them stay warm. Um, and one of the things we really wanna to try to understand is how these certain features help them in their environment. Um, so just to help you not to always think about animals only, adaptation is everywhere in the, uh, well, king, like in the different domains of life. So also plants and bacteria do adaptation. So if you think about this pitcher plant that has adapted to survive on these uh, low nutrient soils, it has formed leaves that form a pitcher in which insects can fall into and which, uh, from which they can feed. So, but also a very important question is, why should we care about understanding adaptation and evolution? And it has like kind of two sides. One is the fun and interesting side and one is the more practical side. So obviously to study adaptation and study biology, it is fun to, to discover new species, but also to understand biodiversity to, um, and to explore nature. But um, in addition to just kind of, you know, we, we do our work because we think it's, it's interesting and we have fun doing it, but we also do our work because we think it's really important. So, you know, the more that we can understand the natural world, the better we can do at conserving wildlife. Um, just in general, understanding biodiversity is really important to understand how ecosystems function, how they, you know, sort of help protect the environment um, in ways that are even beneficial to humans. In things like, you know, understanding how evolution works can help us understand how even things like the germs that make you sick, how those are evolving, and maybe that can help us, you know, stop diseases. So evolution and adaptation are kind of these big central questions or these big central parts of biology that um, really affect a lot of the things that we care about. So we think it's important to study as well. Um, and so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the work that I do um, studying um, Oh, whoops, sorry. There we go. So I do my work um, down in the Bahamas in these, uh, on these little islands that you can kind of see in this picture. And the reason I do my work down there is these islands, we can kind of treat these little islands as sort of small test tubes where we can set up a little experiments and then see what happens and watch, really watch evolution in action and try to understand how um, different ecological interactions shape how evolution works. And so I study these lizards. So the lizard on the top part is called uh, Anola sagri, and that's our main study species. You don't see them in, in Canada. They, they really like the warmth, but if you go even in the southern parts of the United States, you can find them all over the place, um, even in big cities. And we, on these small islands, there are all these Anola sagri, and on some of the islands, we introduce a competitor species. This is this green lizard that you see in the lower left. And I'll tell you in a second why it has all that red on it. And then we also, on some islands, we introduce a predator species. And this is what we call the curly-tailed lizard. It's the big lizard down on the right. And so what we can do is 
in these little test tubes, these little islands, we can add species, we can take species away, and we can change all the different ecological interactions that the species have. Are there lots of predators to worry about or are there no predators? Are there lots of competitors to worry about or are there no competitors? And by doing this, we can see how these other ecological species, these ecological interactions affect how they evolve. And this is really important for understanding things like invasive species, right? So an invasive species, a species that comes in from a new area, maybe from another country or for somewhere else that it wasn't, you know, it, it, it's coming to a new place that wasn't before, that can really change the ecological interactions of the species that are already there. And so hopefully by studying something like this, we can sort of figure out what might happen when an invasive species comes in. And so we've been doing this experiment for a long time. And one of the things like, so this is me with some of the other folks who are working on the experiment. One of the things we do is we try to track how many lizards there are on all our islands. And we do this, you see these little um, squirt guns. These are little squirt guns we have that we fill with paint. And so we go around on the islands and we just shoot a little bit of paint on each lizard. And we do this over multiple days with different colors of paint. And in that way, we can sort of count how many lizards are there on each island. So that's why that green lizard had a little bit of red on it. And we, we use red paint on the second day when we go out. And we take these population surveys and we can track what happens when you add, or when you add a predator or take it away. How does that affect how big the populations of the other lizards are? Um, another big thing we want to look at is um, sort of the, the traits, the physical characteristics of the organism. And so what we do is we actually go out and we can catch the lizards. So that's me trying to catch a lizard. We, we basically tie a little lasso out of dental floss and we try to loop it around the lizard and catch the lizard. And then we take it back to our, to our lab where we have a little x-ray machine and we can measure the, the size of the lizard skeleton. And we can look at things of, of, you know, how long are their legs, how big is their body, all these different facts of, of you know, how they can sort of move around in their environment. Is it better to have longer legs or shorter legs? And so we can look at changes in these things through time. And one of the big things, for example, that we've seen in our experiment is that when you take our study species and you add predators to that island, the predators um, are kind of slow um, or kind of not very agile. Um, so it's hard for the lizards or it's hard for the big predators to catch these, these um, little um, brown and all species, and all segri. Um, but even still, they can catch them sometimes. And what we find is actually that the lizards that have longer legs are a little bit faster at sprinting. So they're a little bit better at getting away from predators. And we can actually see this happen in our experiment that as you add predators, and especially the more predators you add, you have this advantage for having longer limbs, longer legs that can sprint better. And so that's one of the messages I guess I wanna, want you to take home is that actually we can go out and we can do experiments and study in the wild and see evolution happening. Evolution can happen really quickly. It isn't always just something that happens slowly over thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so that's what I work on. Um, so now I want to tell you about what I'm working on. So this is a sea catfish. So catfishes are usually freshwater, but as you can well, guess from the name, it's a sea catfish. So they live in the coastal areas and well, almost all tropical and subtropical regions, so everywhere where it's warm, very close to the coast. And I'm, I'm interested in those species because some of the species have adapted to live in freshwater. And this is actually quite a big thing since only 4% of, of all fishes manage to deal with freshwater and salt water. So it's physiologically very challenging for a species to do that. So it's a kind of an adaptation and, I, and I'm interested in understanding how that works. So um, I looked at the skull shapes of some marine, so seawater species and freshwater species, and I tried to understand how their skull um, changes when they go to the freshwater and whether all the freshwater species would develop kind of the same skull shape as a, as a kind of an adaptation. So for my studies, I got to go to cool places. I got to go several times to Venezuela 
and Panama. So this is a map of um, Northern South America and Mesoamerica. And here I want to point out all these amazing people that I got to meet during my studies, like all these locals and sometimes also indigenous people that are essential to do our work actually, um, since they have most of the knowledge of the local fauna and flora, uh, which we just would not be able to, to get uh, during the short time scales that we are usually in the field. So they, they are essential part of our research. Um, this is just to give you an impression like how it looks like when I go fishing. So this is on the top of the boat is Samuel, our fisherman, and we are usually setting nets around like 4 a.m. in the morning. So we have to get up really early. Um, and this is what we catch. So on the left side, you see a juvenile sea catfish. It's teeny tiny and it will grow about 40 centimeters once it's adult. And on the right side, you see a different species, but an adult one, and you, see, you can see it's massive. So these fishes are actually um, used for consumption. So they are marketed fresh and are uh, important, of important economic value to the local people. And the back, you can actually also see a, a shark, which is smaller than the sea catfish. Um, also, what I want to highlight is science doesn't need to be fancy. Uh, here I'm angling with just a line uh, attached to it is a hook. Like we don't need angles, yeah, fishing rods to do that. And yeah, and this is what I did most of my time when I'm in the field. Um, so the last point I want to make is that you don't necessarily have to go to fancy places to do exciting research, but you can also find, do cool stuff in front of your doorstep. Like this is a map of Montreal in the center, you see Montreal Island, and in orange uh, highlighted is the Ottawa River, and in blue is the St. Lawrence River. So these two rivers differ quite uh, remarkably in ionic composition, and native species don't mind in which river they are, they're just, uh, they can do it, be in the Ottawa River or the St. Lawrence River, but uh, the round goby, which is depicted in the lower left of the picture, is an invasive, invasive species that's coming up from the Great Lakes. And it cannot go into the Ottawa River. So I'm also studying um, like, what does it take for an invasive species to be successful? And what is different between our native species and the invasive species that we have here in Montreal? And with that, we'd like to finish. Well, thank you guys. Um, just before we move into the q and I'd like to remind those classrooms who are joining us live um, to direct their questions um, to the Q&A, which you can find in the bottom center of the Zoom console. Um, so our first question today um, is, is about, uh, I believe, Tim, your research, and they're wondering if islands are best to observe evolution. Are islands best to observe evolution? So they're very useful places to do experiments, but I wouldn't say they're best to observe evolution in that you can, as Madeline was saying, you can really kind of see evolution happening all over the place. So you can go in, in you know, city parks, you can see evolution, um, you know, yeah, really evolution is happening everywhere. And we study the, the, the islands because they are really convenient to do experiments with. It's sort of harder to do experiments in sort of big open places. And sometimes being on a little island makes it easier to, to sort of do the work. So we've got a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, and they're wondering, how does um, observing evolution change um, between model species like animals or bacteria? Yeah, so in general, I guess it's one of the things that it's kind of easier to see evolution happening whenever the time of the generation is shorter, right? So especially like on the time scale of what we work in, if we work for four or five years, then it's easier to see evolution happening if there have been many generations in that time. So some things like bacteria have a really, really short generation time. So they might have, go from, from parent to offspring in even just a couple hours or a couple days. And so that can be really easy to see evolution happening quickly. Whereas something that lives a really long time, it can be a bit harder to, to, to watch that. So in those lizards that you study, how, how long is the typical generation time there? Yeah, so for us, the generation time is 
just under a year, just about a year. So we've been, we've been watching the islands for eight years now. So eight generations or so. And that's enough to actually see some change. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, this is, I think a lot of people think that evolution happens really slowly and it's something that you can't necessarily watch happen, but yeah, I mean, even within just a few years, you can, you can see that. Um, our next question today comes from the students in Lindsay. Um, and they're wondering how many uh, species of fish can survive in fresh as well as salt water. Um, <clears throat> so it's, um, the estimate is about 4%. Uh, so how many species is that? I'm actually not quite sure. <laughs> but about 4% of known fish species? Of all teleos fishes. Okay. Interesting. I um, mean, how many do you study? Um, so I study um, the entire family of sea catfishes, which are, um, comprises about 140 species. Um, obviously, I'm focusing on the neotropical ones. So those to the um, northern South America and Mesoamerica, just for practical reasons, since we have collaborations there. And like, then it's easier to get permits because you always have to get permits to do your studies. Um, yeah. um, the students at Dart and Dartmouth, Nova Scotia are wondering, what or who inspired you to study evolution um, and adaptation? Um, <clears throat> I think for me, it was, I was just always curious, like how nature works and obviously nature is changing. So, and once I realized that I learned, okay, this is called evolution. Um, so before I, well, after school, I did not know what to do, but uh, like taking a year off helped me to, to understand that I want to learn how evolution works. And that's what I studied in the end. Yeah, I guess for me, so um, like Madeline, I was always, you know, sort of interested in animals and the outdoors and that sort of thing when I was a kid. And then when I, so I'm from, um, I'm from Illinois in the United States, like the, the southern part of Illinois. Um, so I grew up in like an agriculture area with a lot of cornfields. And then when I, I went on a scuba diving trip in Florida and I saw coral reefs for the first time and I saw, you know, hundreds of species of fish and thousands of species of coral and all this um, sort of really kind of inspiring um, biodiversity. And I think that was really what kind of set me on, on studying evolution and adaptation it was going out and, and seeing it. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that you often work with um, local scientists when you go and do these um, field studies. How do you make that connection beforehand or do you meet people on the ground? How is that done? Um, so this, it differs from situation to situation. Usually we have already people in the institute or in the lab who are from these countries. Um, most of the times it's standing collaborations that our advisors have, like our professors. Sometimes you establish them by yourself, just sending an email because you know, oh, this person does interesting stuff and you just write to them like, oh, I do this and you do this and why won't, uh, don't we work together? So it can take different routes. So our next question today comes from Alex and he's wondering how long um, did you study in Panama for? So I've been three times uh, to Panama and my field trips usually take between um, three and a half weeks and six weeks. Yeah. And you do your research there and then, and then come back to Canada after you've collected all your data? Exactly. So um, uh, before I've uh, been in Switzerland, so we would collect all our stuff, which is um, for my studies was um, bones. So we would macerate the fishes. We would just retain the bones that we wanted. We would take fin clips to extract DNA later, and we would export that to Switzerland. Um, the last time I did all the analyses, still being in Panama. Um, so Panama is really great country to do research because there's the Smithsonian Research Institute, the Tropical Smithsonian Research Institute to try. And it has um, great facilities and you can actually do everything right there on the spot. Um, our next question comes again from the students in Lindsay and they're wondering, how did you two begin working together? Okay, well, we joined the same lab. Yeah, yeah so um, the, 
we, yeah, we were both interested in similar questions. And so we joined, I guess I joined a couple of years before and then Madeline joined a few years later. But yeah, we just joined the same lab. Yes. Um, for our students that are watching today um, that are maybe not sure what that process looks like, how do you go about um, joining the lab and what does that look like? Yeah, so um, but usually what happens um, while you're doing your undergraduate degree, often people major in something like biology or ecology, although that isn't necessarily, you don't have to do that. You can major in sort of whatever. Um, and then you really think about kind of, I guess mostly what people do is it's a little bit less like applying to university where you think about what university do you want to go to and more about thinking about what type of research do you want to do and who do you want to work with. And so you think about what research interests you and then try to find researchers in the field who are doing that sort of, doing those sorts of studies. So, you know, I looked at different people who are studying adaptation and, and evolution out in the wild. And then you contact the, the professors and ask if they have space in their labs, ask if they have ways to support students. And then um, if they do, you, you apply to, to the school. Yeah, so it's a lot more about thinking about who does the research and less about picking a university, I would say. Yeah, for me, the same, since I'm a postdoctoral researcher, um, so I'm beyond the phase Timis, I actually, I applied to third party funding. So I have my own money to be here. I have my own project and now I just needed to have an advisor. Um, so someone who's working in a related field who would host me. And so I found Rowan uh, and he was kind enough to take me. Um, yeah, and then it's uh, more synthesis of everybody who comes to a lab and then we actually create also new ideas and new, new projects. Well, those are all the questions um, we have for today. But before we go ahead and end, I was hoping to have the two of you talk a little bit about your career path um, and maybe some advice for students who are, who are considering something similar for themselves in the future. Yeah, so I guess I, I, can, I can go first. Um, so I had a, uh, I guess a pretty traditional career path for someone doing this sort of thing in, in some ways. So I, in my undergraduate degree, when I got my bachelor's, I majored in, in biology. And while I was at my uh, university, I started to do research as an undergraduate. So this is a, becoming more and more of a common thing that a lot of labs offer ways for um, undergraduates to do research projects and kind of get started in science. So I think that's a really good way to, to start figuring out what you're interested in and, and you know, whether doing science you know, full time is something that you really want to do. Um, and then after I graduated, I worked as a field assistant, actually in Panama as well. I worked for, um, for a, a more senior scientist as their, their field assistant. So, you know, going out, catchy, I was actually working with butterflies. So I went out and I caught butterflies and raised butterflies and did a lot of research um, with that. And that was another good way to sort of um, figure out what I wanted to do. And then from there, I applied to graduate school, um, sort of I was, as I was mentioning. So I guess that my advice would be to, to start thinking about or start trying to do research, you know, re relatively early on and you try and doing it while you're still doing your undergraduate degree. Because it's a great way to both kind of gain experience, but also to figure out if it's, you know, what you're, what you're really interested in. Yeah. Um, so I'm from Europe. I'm from Germany. So I did my bachelor's in, in Germany and I studied life sciences first with a focus on genome research. Um, for my master's, I did molecular biology because I really like the small stuff. So I like to understand how molecules work together, like in, um, I can't remember the word in English, sorry. Um, so, but also the same as Tim, in my second semester of my bachelor's, I applied to a research assistant position. And since my second semester, until I left university, I think five years later, I've been a research assistant in the same lab. So I learned all the techniques and also how to approach research questions very early on. And that helped me a lot to, to, well, to, to, to learn what I want to study and how I would do that. So after that, I went um, to do a PhD in Switzerland, in Zurich. And I changed quite the field. I did something very different. I didn't stick with molecular biology, but I did um, morpho morphological studies. So to understand how, how morphology changes. And 
which also, again, just added more tools to my scientific toolkit, if I can say that. And that helped me a lot to, to really develop a research line for myself, like what do I want to do in my future? You, you have to be very aware of what you want to do and how you would reach that goal. Like, yeah. So and now I'm here in Canada as a postdoc. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you um, to both of you for taking the time to share your research and for answering all, all of our questions today. Thank, thank you, you, Ben. Yeah, it's fun. Thanks. So more information about these webinars and other PIR educational programs are available at PIRweb.org. Thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful day.